Uh, thank you for coming to my Saturday at the Lab presentation. Uh, today I will be talking about shark tracking and imaging with ASVs and quadcar. Okay, so what does all that mean? Well, to start, we'll talk about this outline and kind of figure out what this presentation will be all about. Uh, we're going to start with some personal background of mine and why I'm interested in robotics and how that relates to my research. Then we'll actually talk about uh, my research and what's going on there. We'll talk about the theory behind what I've been doing. Then go into the hardware and like look at some cool videos. And then we'll talk about some future work that I'll eventually be doing. And then we'll conclude with um, some questions. Okay. So, more personal background. I am from Sioux City, Iowa. So that's pretty far away from <laughs> California. <laughs> so you might be asking, oh, what brings you here to California, sunny California, where the weather is so much better? <laughs> um, well, I'm pursuing a, a bachelor's in engineering at Hurry Mudd College, and hopefully we'll be graduating in 2020. Uh, my, I'm doing research with the Lab for Autonomous and Intelligent Robotics, LAIR. Uh, it is run by Christopher Clark, uh, Professor Christopher Clark. He is mostly known for multi-robot systems. Uh, if you are familiar with Amazon and their robot system, he was the software architect for the system where uh, multiple robots go around their factory warehouse, pick up their uh, giant storages, and then move them around in order to increase Amazon production. Um, so why am I interested in robotics? Well, uh, my first experience with robotics was probably BattleBots. I remember um, watching the first BattleBots when I was really young. <laughs> it's hard for me to remember back then, but that kind of like first sparks. I didn't really know what was going on, but I thought it was kind of cool. So then uh, later on in middle school, I started getting to like Lego Robotics, where it was very easy access to get into it. And then eventually in high school, I started doing the first tech challenge which is a competition which puts high schoolers teams against each other where they have an annual challenge where you have to build a robot to complete a challenge and try to accumulate as many points as possible in a select amount of time and you try to compete against other high school kids. So the, re the reason I really like robotics is because I really enjoy the intellectual challenge behind it. It's, it's, it's like really cutting edge and it's just kind of hard to grasp everything all at once, but you can just keep uh, chipping away at it and then eventually figure out like, oh, I can actually do this. And then you get acquire like a vast skill set. Uh, in the, that similar vein, I really like the like mix and mesh of uh, software and hardware. I really like code and I also like hardware. I really, me personally, I can't sit at a desk all day just typing away at a computer doing software. So I like to mix and match and just like, I think robots are really cool. <laughs> so <laughs> that's uh, what it boils down to. So that was in the past, but so now why am I interested in robotics? Well, it's basically the same thing as before. I think it's just really cool and stuff like that. But uh, further than that, I really like improving the lives of others, and I think robots can really help do that. So a lot of the tasks today, like Humans are required to do mundane tasks, time-consuming tasks, like tasks that can be dangerous and stuff like that. Example, uh, vacuuming your house. No one really wants to do it, but you kind of have to. Uh, so that task can become somewhat mundane. So cue the Roomba that is supposed to come in and clean your house automatically. However, as you can see, it's not always 100% the best case. <laughs> so that's where uh, research comes in. And we're always trying to improve upon existing technology and try to generate new ones in order to improve everybody's life. And that's kind of my MO when it comes to robotics. So with all this talk about robotics, let's kind of decompose what is robotics in a very broad sense. So in this control loop uh, kind of thing, uh, you can see this is what I kind of consider what a general idea of robotics is. So for a robot, it must localize where it is. So the idea is like, oh, you know where you are in space, but it's very hard for a robot to understand what where it is in space. So it has to have some prior knowledge of given a map, oh, based upon these features in the map, I know I'm here. Based upon where it's at, then it has some cognition of deciding what it should do, and then maybe it has some user inputs to think like, oh, I need to go from point A to point B. So you can think of autonomous vehicles. 
uh, like an Uber or whatever like that. So you want to get from point A to point B, you tell this autonomous car, oh, I am here, I want to go there. Then it has to figure out what's the best way to go from point A to point B. Motion control, very straightforward, where it's like figuring out what's the best way to navigate this area. Then you perceive uh, what, where you're at, because oftentimes it's not perfect. So even though you say drive forward five feet, it's not always going to be five feet. It might be four and a half. It might be 5.5, et cetera. So you have to constantly adapt to your environment and figure out where you are at. And then with that new information, figure out what's the next step I need to take. So that's kind of revised in a very broad nutshell. So continuing now to what my research is about. Uh, so the task that I'm trying to improve is improving how video footage of sharks are obtained. So right now, the usual methods of obtaining shark behavioral data, it requires that people stay on boats for like 24 to 48 hours straight, just tracking and following these sharks. And oftentimes uh, that can be a really long, tedious process, but it requires a lot of dedicated man hours to get the data. Additionally, when they want video footage of sharks, you have to uh, fly a quadcopter usually overhead and these quadcopters have very finite flight times. So you can think of it just in order to get a small amount of data, you have to fly it and then come back, put down, take out the battery and recharge it for a really long time, like comparatively to how much data you acquired. So that's like less than optimal. So this project is kind of a branching up point and a continuation of previous projects with shark tracking. In previous projects, we had a different robot called the Iver, which was an underwater torpedo shaped robot which use hydrophones and acoustics in order to track sharks. So this project is a little bit different, but it's still using robots in a similar vein. So how do we actually go about to figure out how to come up with a multi-robot system to fix this problem of uh, acquiring and like optimize this um, solution of finding getting video data? So this leads to the proposed solution of a mixed multi-robot system of autonomous service vehicles, which is this like boat platform thing. I'll call it ASVs from now on. And uh, autonomous quadcopters, which is uh, a lot of people call them drones nowadays. I like the term quadcopter. <laughs> um, and quad usually comes for the four rotors, the four motors and propellers on its um, actual body. So the proposed idea was you have these autonomous service vehicles that will be uh, navigating in the water. They will kind of post up where a bunch of sharks are known to be located. And then you will have these quadcopters fly around and get video data. But because the battery life of these quadcopters are so finite, we want them to come to the ASV, land on them, then recharge, and then take off again. That way you can go for a walk. So we're so just preface we're a little bit far away from that, but um, we're getting there. I so, assume it's about 20 minutes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So right now we are using the 3DR solos as like a proof of concept point. Uh, the 3DR solos have supposedly a, a 20 minute flight time, but what I've been getting out of five minutes usually. So I've also been like kind of pushing them because additional hardware on it. But uh, comparatively, the ASV should have battery life of around like two hours. Can you attach additional batteries to it? To uh, the, the thing is with quadcopters is they are built specifically to house a specific battery as well as if you load up too much material, they cannot fly. So the, the idea is you want to keep them as small and mobile as possible. Otherwise, you risk, like you have to just keep putting more motors. It's like a balancing act. So now to move on to like the theory about like, now that we have this system, what, how are we going to coordinate their motion? And then from there, how do we actually implement the hardware? So the idea is, let's say you have this area where you have known fish movement, uh, known shark behavior indicated by these colored dots. So you can take this data and then discretize it or break it up into uh, locations of interest where you know that, oh, the sharks are gonna be at this location or X amount of time, or there's a high probability of them being here. So you can discretize this area and then have quadcopters survey these specific points in order to just make it more efficient. Um, 
so then I won't bore you with the math, but <laughs> but the idea is once you have this uh, area that you want to survey, you can encode a mathematical expression that kind of dictates whether or not the quadcopters will move to this location or move away from this location or like stay at that location. So in this case, uh, the numbers that you see bouncing around are quadcopters, and the red circle is an ASV. So in this situation, we have encoded it so the quadcopters will bounce around surveying the area, and then when they want to go recharge, they just pop in uh, to the red dot, and then re and you have like set amount of time which they should be recharging there for. So right now I have like two kind of periods that I do. There's a transition period which just basically cycles them all through. That way there's no traffic jams. That way the uh, quadcopter that wants to recharge gets to the actual ASV. And then there's a surveying period which is designed to try to match the distribution of sharks and with the distribution of quadcopters. So you can think of maybe at this location there's 50% of the sharks will be there 50% um, of the time or whatever. So you want the quadcopters to hang out there 50% of the time because it doesn't really make sense to say, oh, if there's a lot of sharks here, you don't want a lot of quadcopters there. You want to try to match them up as best as possible. So that's all well and good with all this simulation stuff, but how do we actually go from simulation to hardware is the real question. So, so this is the hardware of the ASV that I built from scratch. Um, it was a little like, <laughs> uh, let's kind of Black rush piece. together. <laughs> but um, it was, we used a lot of like uh, parts that we found lying around campus and it was just trying to get up in the water and trying to see if it's even actually possible. So there's a lot of trial and error. As you can see in the first version, it was very low set to the water, but my research advisor reminded me that waves are a thing. So, <laughs> so then from there, we um, uh, redesigned it in order to be about a foot off the water. And then in the third revision, we just added different 3D printed parts and then add more robust uh, colors and other things. Like that. And that's the current iteration, but there'll be more to come. So, um, So right here you can see a video of the actual boat we built uh, na aut autonomously navigating. The way it does this is it has a, a couple of uh, sensors on board. It has an IMU, which is an inertial measurement unit, which basically measures uh, acceleration and heading depending, uh, depending upon which way is north. That way you can determine, oh, if I'm facing north, and I want to get to this location, I need to go in this direction. Well, and we, there's also a GPS unit, which just like most of your phones have, can determine, oh, I'm at this location in space with a number of satellites in the air. So with this information, it then uh, calculates a trajectory for, in order to get from point A to point B. And this is just showing some uh, autonomous tests done down at the docks that shows this is the hardware, and then this is the graphical user interface I encoded to then kind of show the similarities. I think they're a little bit out of sync, but the idea is it's a catamaran design, so there's two motors on either side, so that it just propels itself accordingly. Um, good. So now I'm moving on to the quadcopters. Which, so, which quadcopters are you using? Uh, 3DR Solos. They're uh, open source right now because their company went out of business. <laughs> uh, but so this is a test uh, from two different perspectives: the onboard camera and a uh, sideline camera, uh, and the graphical user interface I encoded. It's based in this scenario. I hard coded it to survey a Pentagon area and have it just move around in this area. So this was a original test with a single quadcopter and then just having it do dry land tests before we get into water. Um, right now in this onboard video, it's just fixating on a certain point, that way we can, but in the future, most likely what we'll have is just survey downward, that way they can just look at the sharks. Uh, in this case, it was just uh, trying to survey the area as best as possible. So this was like an original concept. So, 
that's one part of the quadcopter kind of business where you have a survey. But the real tricky part, in my opinion, is trying to get it to actually land properly on the actual platform. <laughs> so that goes to this. So in order to uh, have it land properly on a platform, uh, we pitched a bunch of ideas, but I think we settled on trying to minimize the amount of information that ASV would have to output and then more or less just have the quadcopters be able to do it all on its own. So in order to do that, uh, I equipped it with an on a different onboard camera that would be able to detect color. Uh, so then it, we would be able to put a visual marker uh, probably orange, but in this case, uh, I was testing it with purple. Uh, that way it could localize where it was and then shift it in order to fixate where on the platform it needed to go and then translate itself over before it dropped back down. So do you consider, because of the movement of the, the platform, that if it didn't quite hit the spot, there would maybe be a little mechanical device on that could you know, move it, slide it over to yeah, yeah. the spot or... So um, right now, we've been playing around with just having like a netting around it, so that way it doesn't slide off, because like, spoiler, like there was a, there was an issue where we accidentally like dropped one in the water. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so mechanical device, I'm not entirely sure. That's maybe an idea that we could look into. Mm -hmm. uh, but for now, I think we've just mainly focused on trying to get it as exact as possible and have like some wiggle room. That's why you can see the marker is a lot smaller than the actual like cardboard platform. Yeah, because I was talking to a sailor friend that got a, he's working trying to get to land. And the mm -hmm. tricky part is with, when you've got that movement in the water, yeah. it's almost impossible to uh, get it to get anywhere near a landing spot. So, yeah. So, additionally to that, what I've been trying to do is have the ASV hold its position in the water. That way, it tracks which way it's drifting based on waves, orients itself anti-parallel, and then just runs its motors a little bit. That way, it can be stationary. I haven't got that quite working yet, but that's the general idea. And you only have the two motors at the back, mm -hmm. so that makes it a little tricky. Yeah, if you put two more on the sides, and you can maybe get that movement a little yeah. more stable. Going in different directions yeah, rather than having, yes. So from there, uh, we did uh, a multi robot system, which then with multiple quadcopters. So in this scenario, we were using three quadcopters that surveyed a similar Pentagon again. In this case, one of them would land, and the, while the other three would um, continue to survey. Uh, the basic setup has it so all of them connect to my central laptop. I then connect to the Wi-Fi network that they, each of them create. So the general setup was each controller and each quadcopter connects to itself through a Wi-Fi connection. So then I just have a bunch of Wi-Fi adapters and then hop onto their connection and then through that uplink and able to autonomously control them. So in this scenario, they're just moving around and uh, just surveying the area. That goes on for a while, but that's the general idea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So what comes next? Future work. Um, so in this kind of system, there's a lot more algorithms and a lot more theory to play around with. So right now, we, I just came up with a controller to actually coordinate the motion. However, what you can do is, if you have this area where maybe the sharks are moving away and like the locations of these like nodes are changing, maybe you want to augment the locations where they are moving. So then you can kind of adapt on the fly. Uh, improved ASV robustness. We want to continually improve the build and maybe buy something off the shelf. Uh, water trials, so going from land to water will be a huge step along the way. And then dynamic ASV locations. So right now, if you saw in the simulation, we just had it so the red uh, circle was at a fixed location. But in the future, what you want probably is to have the uh, ASV move along with the sharks. So that way, you need to coordinate, oh, if the ASV is here, the quadcopters need to go to this location. 
Okay, so acknowledgements. I'd like to thank Harvard Met College for giving me all the resources and the education to actually pursue this kind of research. Uh, Professor Chris Clark for accepting me into his lab and then allowing me to do research and then contribute the guidance. Fellow Air members for helping me out with uh, hardware trials and lugging equipment and the Wrigley Fellowship for allowing me to do research and giving me a place to stay on the island. Um, so we'll go to questions, but if I don't uh, answer your questions or don't get time to it, here's my email. Feel free to shoot me an email if you want to ever talk about robots, because I always am. And uh, the website, so uh, this is the Lair website. If you are interested in my project or any other type of robotic projects, uh, all of those are on there, and you can like contact us. Okay, questions then. So I'll ask the first one. When you, you showed the quadcopters going from one uh, pad to another, moving around, is that sta a classic state um, state machine type of design? Okay, so right now it's a more stochastic controller. Uh -huh. So the idea is there's deterministic and stochastic. So in deterministic, you had it so each quadcopter is hard coded to follow a certain set of uh, like patterns and like commands. So like a state machine. Yeah. I, if I'm here, do this, it, do this, do this. Yeah. Stochastic is more in the sense where if I'm here, given these scenarios, I can, I can, there's a high likelihood that I might make this decision. So the idea was stochastic is a little bit more robust because you can, with less information, you can do more. And then eventually, uh, if you think of that in deterministic, you have to encode every possible situation possible, right? So the stochastic one allows you to use a lot less information to try to get it as close as possible to the hard code. So at each location, uh, what the quadcopter was doing was see, looking at, oh, I, the current distribution of the graph is, let's say, at this location, uh, the quadcopters want to be here 50% of the time. But right now, the distribution is 40% of the time at this location. Therefore, the quadcopter wants to stay at this node, so there's a higher likelihood that they will stay at this location. However, there is some random chance that it will move away. So let's say if it's at 40 not point like 49% and then the desired is 0.5. So there's a likelihood that it will stay in order to get to that 0.5, but there's more of a likelihood that it will move away, opposed to if the desired is 0.5, but then the with the current distribution that's like 0.2, it wants to stay there. So there'll be a higher likelihood that it will stay. And that's more difficult to code that than it is a little the, bit. the deterministic approach. A little now. bit, yeah. yeah. But it also is a little bit more robust as well as the math is a little bit more tricky in order to prove that it will like work out the way. Thanks. Yeah. So I'm assuming with the quadcopters that they're imaging from yeah. from the sky down through the water. I mean, what's what's the quality of the imaging? So uh, it depends on the day, uh, as well as lighting conditions. Um, I'm not too familiar with um, ocean like stuff like that, so mm -hmm. I'm not entirely sure. But that being said, I've looked into somewhat of lighting conditions, and I've talked to Marisa Parker here. here. He told me that certain light polarizers, which uh, cancel out some of the incoming light in order to prevent that glare, is the way to go. So it's possible to prevent light buildup, but um, I don't think it's. It also depends a lot on like sand and other. Things. Well, is there going to be a future idea like these robots would actually be submersible robots, maybe, and do that kind of work underwater? I think it would be possible, but if we think about where the sharks are situated, mm -hmm. you want to get a, a like a very high okay. overhead footage in order to capture a lot of okay. the sharks. It's more of like we want to capture behavioral data of a bunch of a sharks. Population together. of yes. sharks. A population. Okay. I'm not familiar with the hardware, but when you land the copter on the platform, how do you make the connection to the charger? Ah, okay. Yes. Um. So at the moment, our um, uh, like. My research isn't dealing primarily with the charging apparatus. What we're eventually going to be doing is working with a company that is building a specific set of quadcopters to 
interface with their charging mechanism. I'm not entirely sure, but my best guess would be to use induction charging. Yes. So in uh, induction charging, there's like two coils. It's, it's closed. Yeah, it's closed, and then you have like an electromagnetic field, which then uh, wirelessly charges. Yes, yeah, like your phone. phone. Exactly, exactly. Phone yeah, charger. Yeah. It would just need to be a little bit more powerful. Mm -hmm. That way you could bridge the distance. Then are they connected to uh, weather, local weather um, stations that autonomously give them like if they see a 25 knot wind coming over the hill, do they know to fly off? At the, the moment, system? no, but that'd be a great idea. To <laughs> Any other questions? That'll be version four or five. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> or maybe 10. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I heard you were you're going to be tracking these sharks around here. Are you are you thinking of diversifying where you're where you're re where you're seeing these sharks? Are you thinking of of maybe spreading these robots out farther to look at different parts of the area? Okay, great question. Yeah. So um, in this system, there's a lot of like room to play and like do some fun games. So you mentioned um, moving, spreading out, and then visiting locations that sharks are not at. So that's also like a great kind of thing that you want to think about. Where it's like, oh, I know the sharks are here. But why are they not here? So you want to also collect data of locations where they're not at. So the idea of moving to different locations where uh, internet spreading out is definitely something we want to keep in mind. Uh, and then your additional comment about diversifying locations. So end goal would be to go to Florida, where there is the mass migration of white -tip sharks. I'm not, I'm not a biologist, so I'm not entirely <laughs> familiar, but there is, uh, a, from what I've heard and from what I've talked about, there's like a giant migration along the shoreline where thousands of sharks move along the coastline. So the idea would be that's the end goal of having this autonomous boat tag along with these sharks, trying to keep like a safe proximity and then having the um, quadcopters survey overhead while they move along the coastline.